Welcome to episode number 25 of the Carp Angler Chronicles podcast. This episode, we have a very interesting guest, Jason Ryder. For those of you that don't know, Jason owns a bait company called The A Bait. He was also involved with Nash Bait uh, years ago. He worked in the bait factory. He, he helped um, come up with recipes. He, he had a, a key role with Nash Bait. Uh, and he also was lucky enough to work with Bob from R.D. Campbell's. For those of you that don't know, R.D. Campbell's was an old flavor house. They came up with some of the best flavors. The original Tutti Frutti was one of Bob's flavors. Um, and Jason, again, had a key role working alongside Bob. Obviously, Jason's knowledge of flavors and just the bait industry as a general is extensive. You'll find this interview absolutely fascinating if you're at all interested in formulating bait. Um, we go in depth on the flavor side of things purely because obviously Jason has a, a unique experience of flavor houses and how to formulate flavors and what makes an efficient carp flavor. Um, so the, the the stuff that he reveals is absolutely fascinating. Um, we're presenting it in a little bit of a different way. So instead of giving you a you know three, four hour mammoth marathon episode, we've actually decided to split it in two. Um, a few of you have said, you know, as great as the long episodes are, they take quite a lot of digesting. And particularly when we're talking about bait, it can all get quite overwhelming. So we've decided to split it down into two halves. The first half, we're going deep into flavors and, and what carp find attractive. In the second half, we talk a little bit about um, Jason's experience angling abroad. He's got some some good stories um, as far as his foreign trips go. We also obviously talk about bait heavily in the second episode as well. So you don't want to miss either episode. Both bring different things to the table. And as I said, this first one is mostly going to be about flavors and what carp find attractive. Just before we lean into that, Another exciting announcement we have is this is our first sponsored episode. Those of you who have listened recently will remember that we've been looking for a sponsor. Not that we want to make money from this podcast. It's our passion. It's our hobby. It's what we love doing. But it is getting quite expensive to keep it afloat. So we're very proud to announce our sponsor is Carp Hunter Giveaways. Fantastic company, really, really impressed with these guys. Basically, what they do, as the name suggests, um, they do uh, prize draws. So basically, you, you would um, enter into a prize draw for a small fee and you are in with a chance of winning various different goods. It ranges from rods, reels, bivvies, alarms. They give away really, really good gifts. And something that I particularly like about Carp Hunter giveaways is they don't just pocket all the money. They actually donate some of their money back into people with PTSD. Um, I'm sure we'll be divulging a little bit more about that on future episodes. But uh, obviously, it's a great cause. There's a lot of people out there suffering in silence and, and Carp Hunter giveaways. They're very much focused on giving back. Um, so that's absolutely fantastic. You can check them out on carphuntergiveaways.co.uk. Obviously, they're in the usual spots on social media as well. Instagram and Facebook. If you search Carp Hunter Giveaways, you'll be able to find them there. Please go ahead. Give them a follow. Have a look at what they're doing. If it's something that you want to get involved with, I urge you to do so. As I said, fantastic company and the prizes that they give away are absolutely phenomenal. So big thank you to Carp Hunter Giveaways. Check them out. Without further ado, let's lead in to the episode with Jason Ryder. How long have you worked in the industry, Jason? It depends what you call work. I mean, I, I was make, if it makes sense, I was making fishing bait even before I was fishing for carp, really. So I started fishing 40 years ago um, and I started carp fishing 36 years ago. Now, I was fortunate enough in, in my local lake that it had carp in it and obviously carp anglers with high tech in the days were Mitchell rods, one and a half pound glass rods, mm. beacon bite alums, all that sort of nonsense. And they were three lining potatoes. Um, and I sort of looked at it and I thought, this is ridiculous. Do you know what I mean? Even though I knew nothing about catching carp other than catching sort of two or three pounders on lunch and meat on a float and stuff. I mean, I was a general course angler, but I watched what they were doing and I thought this is just stupid. I mean, the other thing was bread and bubble floats, you know, chasing them around, thrashing it to a foam in the summer. And you could stand from an elevated position. You could see these carp on the top, 
But at that point, I still didn't really want to catch them. But I was interested in what they were doing, if that makes sense. Um, so the next progression was for a sort of 14 or 15 year old kid to stay out all night, night fishing. And that sort of changed the game because I hooked and landed my first, you know, decent cart, which would have been a, a 12 pound common, but on like float fish tackle, four pound line, you know, it was pretty epic stuff, really. It just about went in my net. And after that, I started looking into it a bit. And I actually started making cart baits by design before I'd even fished for them, you know. Um, from that progression, obviously got into the baits. Hutchinson was quite a big influence. Used to write to him and the guy always replied and he always sent back a stamped address envelope so I could talk to him, um, which, you know, in these days now of internet um, and TV and videos and stuff, I think that link's sort of missing a bit. Um, I mean, my heroes of the day, like Hachi, Maddox, um, Rob Malin, Steve Briggs. I mean, we used to go to the slideshows. Um, used to be at Dunstable, Stevenage, um, Wembley. And you could meet these guys and they would talk to you, you know, and they would tell you what they were doing. And it, it, was, it was like a different world. So even from that point, I've always done my own little thing in my own little bubble. And, and that hasn't changed to this day, really. Mm. You know? Yeah, amazing. We we were lucky enough to have our first guest uh, for this podcast was Steve Briggs, which was obviously quite a touch for us. But um, I know what you mean. It, it seems like this day and age, everything's just that little bit more, even though social media is so prevalent and it should be the opposite. It's just we're kind of more disconnected in a way, aren't we? I think. Well, Steve, Steve's a perfect example, right? Because um, people say, oh, it's not surprising what he catches because he gets access to all these great waters and great swims. But the guy is so consistent. Everywhere he goes, he catches great fish. But he's also so laid back about everything he does. Yeah. You know, there's there's no – it comes across in his videos and when you talk to him, there's no pressure on him to catch. He's there because he enjoys it, you know, and that's what he does. Um, and he's not fame-hungry or anything or – he just loves what he does and he'll talk to anyone about it. I mean, the, the guy, let's make no bones about it, is a carp catching machine. Mm -hmm. He's a phenomenal angler. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, without a shadow of a doubt. Without a doubt. Well, Jason, I mean, we're going to be talking a lot about bait. Obviously, this this podcast very well known for going into the, the depths of bait construction. Um, I'm sure most of you know, but Jason owns a bait company called The A Bait. Uh, previous to that, you used to work for Nash, as you alluded to. You also used to work for R.D. Campbell's. Is that right? Yeah. Um, so, you know, I started off making my own baits and I could see they worked, you know, because they were sort of catching more than other people. And it progressed and it progressed. And I'd hate to think how much time I've invested in thinking about any form of nutrition or ingredients or what I can source. Um I mean, I might tell you some of the things I've sourced below. It might make you wince a bit. Um, and it, it progressed from there, really. You know, my friends wanted me to make them bait, and I was making them bait, and it got bigger and bigger and bigger. And then at one point, I realised I had virtually no time for fishing because all I was doing was making baits for my friends. So then I started using sort of third parties to contract role for me, um, having more and more input into that, tweaking base mixes, ingredients and things. And it sort of gave me a bit more time to go fishing. Um, I mean, the A-bait started, what we're talking, like 11 years ago. And it was actually called Acid Baits UK then, because um, I was oh, working really? along this pH theory. And it had like a nice ravey face on the labels, which I particularly like, sort of having come from that scene. Yeah. Um, but it's... And if any form of acid scares people shitless, um, you know, even, even sort of bait makers, you know, I don't want to touch something that's acidic because it's going to sort of rip my hands off, you know. Mm. Um, I mean, I, I've, I've had my lungs and face whipped off, but it wasn't from acids. It was from vitamins. Um, and I've also got um, a spot. I can handle almost anything. I've been covered in almost everything. The only thing I'm allergic to is spirulina. Um and there's a bit of a story behind that. I, obviously, you've got a bit of time. Um, so I was working at Nash, and we got this massive hopper for making powder mixes, makes a ton at a time. 
you stand on a mezzanine and the recipe is in sacks, you know. Um, and the last sack of the day was spirulina, which clouds up pretty heavily. Anyway, I thumped it in, ran down the stairs. But obviously, I'd inhaled a good amount of it. Um, driving down the 127, it was like gridlock traffic. And I was sneezing and coughing and sneezing and coughing. And I found myself completely unable to breathe. Um, in the end, it got so bad, I was, I was crawling along the hard shoulder. Now, I worked for the highways agency for about 15 years. And I used to get pelted on a daily basis by what we know as urinate, right? You can work out exactly what that is. Um, well, I would, if I could have found a bottle of urinate lying in the ditch, I would have drunk that instantly because my throat was closing up. Um, and I was looking at these people in cars and I was, I was you know, I was pretty much dying. Um, and th I, this girl like looked at me in a VW Beetle and clicked the deadlock on. <laughs> I was going half at it now. And luckily this Turkish lorry driver came out and gave me some water and it sort of opened my throat. But that was a bit of a dodgy one. Did a bit of work with Bob, um, mm. who was a right sort of character as yeah. well. Yeah, yeah. Um, do you ever, you ever talk to Bob or meet Bob? I, I spoke to him on the phone. I mean, he wouldn't have a bloody clue who I was. But yeah. Um, yeah, ve so, very helpful guy. Very, very helpful. So Bob used to have an assistant called Kevin, um, who he called his lab boy. Um, well, Kev Kevin was 72. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I think I think Bob was about 86 when he yeah. died a couple of years ago. But yeah. I mean, he, he was working right up to his death. Um, so there's we, we, we did a lot of work together on sort of copying and analyzing flavors. Mm -hmm. um, and he used to let me come in the label into the lab, you know, and work on bespoke stuff. Um, and there's there's two ways you can copy a flavor. One is with a spectrometer and helium. Um, which is incredibly expensive to do. Or Bob used to just put things under his nose and he could, he had 50 years of experience in the industry and could pretty much just copy something like that and get it quite close as well. You know, the guy, he was really, really a craftsman in what he did. Yeah. Let's just, ju let's just jump, jump in then. When, when it <laughs> flavors, right. That there, there's, there's current hysteria where that's been for a few years about old flavors um, they're going for freaking silly money on on eBay. In this day and age, obviously bearing in mind some substances are, are, are no longer available and different regulations, how feasible is it to reproduce those old classic flavors? Well, yeah, you, you sort of nailed it there, really. Um, I mean, powder palatants, 50 grams going for 400 quid. I've seen it and I just mm. think it. Oh my God, that's that's mental. Yeah. I mean, some of these flavors, you know, I have the exact recipes in my database. Um, I could cr recreate them, but like you said, the industry has tightened up more now, um, and it wants to know more where the end users coming from. Um, so people used to advertise a lot that it was human grade or you know it's human food chain quality. Yeah. Well now. Defra are very much opposed to anything going back into the food chain. Um, so that isn't really viable. But also in terms of marine pollutants, you know, you're, you're only allowed sort of X amount of volume or substance. And it, there is quite high regulation. But if you look at the other side of thing, right, if you said to me, how do you make a shepherd's pie? Um, I mean, I, right, I oversimplify things. I put things in human terms. Some people say that's wrong. Carp haven't got stomachs. They're not humans. But it, it lets people understand and it puts it on a more basic level. So my, my analogy is if you're going to make a shepherd's pie, right, you're, you're going to have some sort of mince meat in it. You're going to have mashed potato. You're going to have onions, maybe some beans or vegetables. That's how you make a shepherd's pie. Now, if you're going to make green zing flavor, you know, that there's only so many things that you can make that with. You know? <laughs> You know what I mean? And if you leave out too many, then it's not green zing flavor. Um, so basically, whatever anyone thinks, the copies now are, aren't a million miles away from of what they're supposed to be. Mm. You know? Yeah, for sure. For sure. I mean, are, are you, <clears throat> I appreciate you You won't want to give everything away, and rightly so. Are you able to to go into some of the, you know, what we'd, we'd call the classic flavors, that could still be replicated to the T? Um, okay, so let me sort of try and give you an example, right? So 
Um, one of the things we might want to talk about later is is fats, yeah, like good fats. Um, they, it's, it's a really, really sort of important part of my thinking at the moment, like lipids and energy. Um, so if I give you another analogy, um, margarine, yeah, which is just a well and emulsifier, um, it can't be processed by the human body or any living body that I know of. If you've got a tub of margarine and you left it outside your doorstep, you know, come back in a year and it's got rain in it and it's got dirt, and it's got dust and it's got pollution, but scrape that off and it's still margarine and no animals will have touched it, right? They can identify it as something that's not particularly good for you. So obviously butter is a natural product, tastes a hell of a lot better. And the reason people don't eat butter is because of the calorific value of it, right? But I'm now telling you that butter is so much better than margarine. Okay, so from a fishing point of view, if you said, uh, oh, a butter flavour, then that must be what, that must be um, a good thing. So why isn't it? Well, okay. So the main two properties in the butter are um, a diacetyl and biteric acid, which everyone knows. Now, what is butter flavouring? It's Scopex, right? How good is Scopex? Um, you know, pe people are using things they don't understand. Um, and really, with, with flavours, um, I, I guess over the years, there's a lot of company, right? They've just got a basic base mix. They've thrown a different flavour in it, lots of it, stick it under an angler's nose, it smells good, and it catches. Um, but the more you work a bait and the less you understand your ingredients, the more you can mess it up. Um, and that's, that's a fact. I mean, a lot of people go wrong in that respect that, you know, they hear Robin Red's good. You know, they hear uh, squid liver's good, liver powder's good. And they just chuck it all in and everything just fights itself in the mix. You know, one cancels out another and you just end up with an expensive mess. Everyone who starts bait making originally, they do it with the intention of saving themselves money and making a cheaper bait. Now, if you stay doing it, you end up making the most expensive baits ever made by mankind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah down to 100 percent, 100 percent. that was quite a long answer really for that not, question yeah. <laughs> not 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 at all that that's what we want you go off you know you you get in the weeds that's exactly what we're looking for um i got i've fucked up again which won't be any surprise to our listeners but i've started to get into the episode without announcing tipple of the episode uh, so Jason, obviously every episode we have a, a different drink. Are you joining us and in having a drink tonight, mate? Um, I've got some dodgy looking brandy up here, actually. That I, uh, that was a Christmas present from one of the guys at work. Yeah. What you I got? What, what is it? Um, it it's it's 30% Portuguese. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know. Should... Let me get it. 30% Portuguese. But... 30% volume rather than a 30% oh, right. I was going to say 70% yeah. from um, multicultural <laughs> just called 1920 that's all it says on the label now I'm pretty sure it's not from 1920 no um, and it's a screw top so yeah we'll try it man nice Pete's here as well lurking lurking in the back like he always does what are you having Pete mate um, I've got a Christmas present as well uh, so I'm on the gin this week. So I've got a Whitley Neal blackberry gin, which mm. I am mixing up with an elderflower tonic water. Very nice. It's actually bloody lovely. <laughs> it's, it's a good one. So camp, oh. mate. I know, mate. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm worse. on. I think I'm on the man stuff here, actually. Yeah, you are. Mine isn't much better. Um, I've got a Heston Blumenthal uh, citrus sherbet gin. Yeah from waitrose just as girly but i've just got normal tonic to be fair so yeah there we go and i've also actually this is this is manly as fuck look i've got salamander black ipa which is 6.8 <laughs> percent. so there we go hopefully i've redeemed myself a little bit we do a, a bit of a biscuit thing fishing i'm notorious for never taking any food with me but i take friends who can cook and who like to cook um, and I supply the bait and they do the cooking. But we do have like a, a sort of biscuit cake thing. Who can bring the tastiest cakes? And uh, I think last year the winner was passion fruit and peach Jaffa cakes. Oh. They were pretty, yeah. I don't feel as bad now. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, fair enough, mate. Yeah, I like it. I like a nice biscuit on the bank. That's got. I've got to say, I it doesn't need biscuit. cooking, right? You know what I mean. Like, exactly. I, I literally my only bit of original fishing tackle that I had left from forty years ago was my gas stove, which everyone laughs at. Um, but I, I treated myself to a jet boil last year. Yeah, they're aren't they just too quick though? Is is too violent? Uh, no, it's good. Um, but again, it doesn't let you do any cooking. So I'm still dependent on other people to feed me. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. You Which just I bought. think is fair enough. Like, you know what I mean? If I'm supplying the bait and stuff, then, you know, That's if, you list, if you're listening, Ian or Steve, cheers, guys. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what was your old stove? Like a Coleman or something? I, no, it was like, I think they called it a bluey or something. I mean, it's covered in rust. And it's one of those ones where you screw the bottle in and half of it screams out the side oh, of you while you're doing it. Yeah. If you remember those. Yeah. yeah, uh, yeah. But, but bless it, it's still up there. It's like my last bit of original kit and I'm reluctant to throw it away for that reason. Uh, yeah, you got to keep that. Yeah, you got to keep that, mate. Fair enough. Um, wow. I mean, I guess we we carry on with the, the fa- flavor theme. I mean... I think we're probably we're going to talk about all aspects of bait creation, obviously. But I think flavors are an area where, am I right in saying you 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 can speak with quite a lot of authority on them? You you you're well experienced with them. Yeah, um, I worked in the lab. You know, I did a bit with Nash, did a bit with with Bob, um, and I, I guess when I first started, you you could go into a, a fishing tackle shop, and there was no real carp tackle, but there was all these little 50 mil bottles of flavors, like sort of along the shelf, like little soldiers all lined up halfway around the shop. And these are the things now that are selling for fortunes. Um, now, if I had to pick half a dozen um, that I would spend the rest of my life fishing with, um, I w- I, that wouldn't be too hard for me. You know, I mean, I could, I could probably do that. Um, th- there's, there's some fantastic, incredible flavors. Um, there's some which, are okay they just change the smell and there's some that don't really do anything i mean i, I made a peach um or a peach of pineapple for one guy and it was absolutely lovely it just smelt like you'd sliced open a fresh pineapple and put it under your nose but it was a useless catcher um and to understand why these flavors work it's not because they've got a 30 year old rod hutchinson label on that's peeling off um you have to sort of look at the ingredients used to make them um, I mean, some people don't realise, you know, there might be 60 or 70 components to making one flavour, yeah. um, to making a concentrate, and then you have a base on it. Now, a lot of these natural identical compounds, when you look at them, you can you can start to understand why. So going back to the fats again, um, so medium chain triglycerides, which are sort of Q fatty acids, mm-hmm. um, People will have heard of caproic and caprylic and things like that, and they'll know they're good carp attractors. But then they're also the basis of cream flavors. You know, so if, if you're going to make a cream flavor, you start off with probably powdered lactones, liquid lactones, um, and then you're going to add sort of co- these fatty acids. So, I mean, they're natural identical things that are appealing in nature and in food stuff, and you're replicating it in, into the flavor itself. Um, I mean, most people just have this vision of all these caustic chemicals, but most of them are based on real life um, and and replicate that. You know, like I said, if you're going to make a butter flavor, then you're going to make you're going to put the essence of of butter in it to make it. You know, it's as simple as that. Um, And going back to the Scopex, you know, I mean, this this is a true story. Yeah. So this guy, um, he told me that the bait was working fine. But he wanted to do his little bit to it, you know, so he made this exaggerated dip and put a lot of biteric acid in it, you know, and put it in and put it on the bait. And he said, oh, you know, it's it's not as effective. And I said, well, I could have told you that before you did it. Um, he said, like, how many drops of biteric acid should I put in per mil? So, right, there's 36, roughly 36 drops um, to one mil of flavor. Now, Scopex. 10 mils of one uh, of one mil would be 10 drops of Scopex in that flavor. So if you've put five, five mil of Scopex in one kilo of boilies, you've already put 50 drops of biotaric acid in the bait. You know what I mean? So putting one or two drops on top of that, 
isn't going to make any difference to the outcome at all. Mm. If anything, it's just going to overdo it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, and, and it's <clears throat> just to kind of make a, a nuanced point. It's it's not it's not the smell that the carp are, it, it's not the smell of strawberries that the carp like. It's all the different individual things that go to making up that flavor. And then, I mean, obviously, we can talk about that that actually they're they're not detecting those things, and actually, it's ionization of the local water. And I know there's lots of ideas on that, and I'm sure we'll get onto that. Um, but yeah, it's a, it, 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 it's a good point, isn't it? And obviously flavors are made up of, of so many different compounds. And I guess that's why there is so, I mean, how many different versions of Scopex could you make? Like millions uh, yeah, you could, different but, ratios but of different things. And, and You could, but they would all be basically, um, on diacetyl and butyric acid. Mm. Um, and probably these days on, on PG on a base. Um, so that they, they wouldn't be a million miles away from it. You, you might smell one and think, you know, I really like that. Now, I mean, Scopix isn't just, it's a 50-50 mix of butter and cream. So the cream is really more of a palatant to bring out the deep, deeper, richer notes. Um, but again, some are better than others, but a lot of it comes down to your own personal experience. You know what I mean? If, if, if you buy two pots of identical hook baits or even two different ones, which, whichever one you catch your first big carp on is going to be your favorite one and the yeah. one that you tend to use the most of, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you're going to get the results on it because you're using it and, and it's yeah, just it, to convince you even it, It's totally confident. It's totally down to confidence. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I, did I tell you the story about what I've been using this year? Possibly. We'll tell, tell the listeners anyway. Okay, so um, a couple of years ago, um, I'm – met Tim Paisley down in Tackle Box in Dartford and I was talking to him and I asked him what was in this product um, from a company from a few years ago that you could, couldn't get anymore. And he said he didn't know, but he knew the guy who made it and find out for me. Anyway, a few months went by, but Tim did get back to me and he, he told me exactly what it was. So I went off on this search looking for this product and I couldn't find it anywhere, to be honest. And I guess that's why they stopped using it as well, because it, it had just vanished from the world. Now, while I was looking for it, I sort of found something not similar, but along the same sort of lines. And I thought, OK, that's worth a go. It sounded quite crazy as well, which I like. Um, so I knocked up some bait and it come out. It was it was really bland and unappealing. Um, you know, it just it, there was nothing about it that sort of fired the imagination at all. Anyway, it's in my tackle box for like about a year or so. Um, and this this April was on my own late and we'd been on a four day blank. The fish were on natural, so they were behaving a bit odd. Anyway, I was going from my tackle box looking to see what I could find. And this tub of hookers rolled out. And my mate Ian said, oh, mate, give me that. And I said, yeah, you can have those. Why do you like them? He said, I've used nothing else for the last year. It's absolutely amazing. And I was like, seriously? And he's gone, yeah, 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 it's phenomenal. It's my go-to bait. And I thought, well, all right, not now it isn't because it's mine. So anyway, wound in all three rods, put it on, and it really to smell it, there was nothing, like I say, nothing to stoke the imagination at all. Um, now in in that four days, I had sort of worked out what the carp were doing a bit, um, and I was sort of on the verge of catching one, I think. But that day, I had three good fifties, um, and they were three fish that I'd wanted from my lake as well. They were on my list to tick off, and that is a good result out there. Um, well, it's a good result anywhere, but it was a good result three in a day. Um, now this season, over eight weeks fishing on that bay, um, I mean, I've got my book here. I've had 132 30s, 71 40s, 16 50s, and four 60s on it. Yeah. <laughs> just, just a few then, Jason. Mate, well... I mean, they're, they're, they really are crazy numbers. And the first question some people say to you is, oh, were they from France? Well, you know, I've been fishing in France for 30 years. I've never had results like that. Yeah, no, that's um, insane. That my, insane. Friend, my friend Steve has had, um, he's had five fifties in his angling career. Um, one week with me, he had 11 in a row. And then the following week, he went to a different lake with another friend. And he had 16 fifties in a row, 16 50 pound plus fish in a row to 80 pound. Um, 
Now, everything about last year was different, right? So there weren't as many anglers on, there weren't the pressure on, fish were behaving differently. Um, but that particular bite, you know, half a dozen people had it. It went to about 10 or 12 different lakes and it, it didn't fail anywhere. Um, so do I think that's a massive edge for this year? Well, yeah, I'm pretty sure it is, to be honest. Yeah, I think bait is can be a massive edge. But, I mean, it seems to be really divided. You get the people who are fucking crazy on bait. Obviously, you're you're one of them, and, and so are we. And then, who obviously, we're always striving for that next edge, aren't we? We can find it. You know, a great bait, but do we just keep using that? No, obviously, we want bigger and better all the time. And then there's the other anglers, which they're just, they're, they're, they're just not interested in it. Um, I think you're right. Like, uh, you get your bait right, or you get this new little edge, and, and that can... It can change your season for sure, can't it? It really, really can. I think more people should realise that, personally. Well, I managed, I managed Nash bait for a year, and I've never, ever used the bait with squid in, um, <laughs> right, which has surprised people. But it, I wasn't going to learn anything from it. You know, having said that I found something really good, chances are next season I'll try something different. Um, but it, it can be like that. And I've, I've always been really transparent about everything I'm doing um i no problem keeping stuff secret no problem giving things away the only reason that i'm not telling everyone exactly what this is is because i found a supplier in poland where i can get this additive and it's the only place on earth where i can get it and i don't even know how much of it they've got um so you know if someone said can you make me 100 tons of bait containing that tomorrow then there's, there's no way in the world i could well over any length of time because I, I don't think I can get it. That's already told you that it's a natural ingredient, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You'll have to tell us when we're not recording, Jason. Um, yeah, yeah. No, it, it's it's absolutely fair enough. It's fair enough, mate. J jumping back, we'll, we'll probably jump around all over the place, but it is fine. Our, our listeners are used to it by now, hopefully. Jumping back to the Scopex, um, and, and you were saying, yeah, obviously it's heavily butter based it is there there's an element of aniseed or aniseed like scent in there isn't there in um, certainly in some versions so do you know what that yeah, is yeah i mean there's there's it's got various little oils and things in i mean one's called fluve oil um fluval fluval yeah if you heard yeah. of that yes yeah. i have yeah yeah so yeah, it, yeah. it it sort of when it's fresh it smells like mown grass so that's probably where you get the aniseed. I mean, mm. I remember people saying that, um, you know, they remember the original having a fishy um, smell in it and stuff. Um, I mean, I, I don't know. Pe people sort of, they remember what they like to remember. Yeah. You know, if I think hard enough, I can remember things I liked about school, but generally I absolutely hated it. Um, I mean, I, I've just copied um, a red carpy, you know, if you remember that one, Duncan Yeah, Kay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And not so much copy it but just make it a bit stronger there was a couple on the market anyway and they're just all a bit weak you know so i've made it a bit stronger and i've spilt a bit in my flat and now it's all i can smell you know <laughs> and every time i walk in the flat i think you know that'd go lovely with a bit of strawberry oil yeah um, but that's but that's a butter that that's got a fair amount of uh of butter scent in it right yeah um it has so i mean you walk in um and, and you think, you know, I could sell a bait because it smells so nice. It smells delicious. Now, there's, there's three things you have to consider with bait making. One, it has to catch fish to start with. Um, two, it, you have to be able to roll it. If you can't mass produce it, then you haven't got a product to sell. And thirdly, people have to like it, you know, otherwise there's, there's no point in making it. Um, so, you know, probably if I made this strawberry carpy bait, it it would probably sell more but again i'm not interested in it you know my my company ebay or whatever it i've never advertised i've never had field testers um i've never done catch reports you know it's just word of mouth it's just friends and it spreads from friends you know and they tell their friends um i've got no aspirations about it being huge because i sort of value my time but even at the moment we're, we're still looking at the possibility of a friend has moved to France this year and we're thinking, is it viable that we could make some bait in France and supply, you know, lakes out there? I don't know. Maybe. I'm trying to uncomplicate my life, if anything, to do a bit more fishing. 
Yeah, aren't we all, mate? <laughs> I mean, a prime, a prime example um, of the flavours. I made, I made um, something I did with Bob, actually, out of curiosity. We were trying to copy the Red Bull flavouring, yeah, uh, which I, you either, you, it's like Marmite, isn't it? You either love the smell of it or hate it. Um, but we, we, we got it pretty close. And even before I put it in a bait, I was selling little 50 mil bottles. And I think I saw, I'd sold about 10 bottles of it on my website. And out of those 10 bottles, at least four were other flavour companies that took it off and got it copied, you know, and they pretty soon had Red, bait, uh, Red Bull um, baits out. And, and to be honest, it was a pretty good catcher as well. It was grenadine was the main note. I think orange was the top note. Um, I forget what the other was, but. This is, this is a new one to me, mate. It, Red Bull. What's it smell mm. like? Yeah, so it's like grenadine, pomegranate is, is the basis of the flavour. And right. I think we started off with Rod's um, grenadine recipe on that. Um, and it, it, it was a good catcher, but it was a gimmick, you know. Um, and obviously it was a really good gimmick because it was plagiarised by about three or four different sets of guys off me before I could even use it. Right. This is – all right. When was this? It, Oh mate, it's um, oh, it's probably a good ten years ago. You know, oh. honest. I mean, we we, we never heard pop- of that, mate. Yeah, never we heard pop- of Red Bull at all. Yeah. We did pop ups and we called them we called them Jaeger bombs. You know, <laughs> it, was, it was yeah, and and they were they were good. People people still sort of send me pictures of stuff um, like, "What's this, mate?" You know, I mean, it's like something I made ten years ago. I think mm. you know, I haven't got a clue. If everyone thinks you have this magic recipe book. Well, I mean, my liquids book tends to be sort of on a hard drive. Now it's quite organised, but my powder recipe book is just a moth-eared old diary. You know what I mean? It's probably I'm the only one who could even read it. Yeah. yeah. And I think most most bait, bait companies are the same. You know, it's not like there's the holy grail. It's just like a moth-eared old book covered in stains from spilt stuff. Yeah, yeah. About 10... 10, 11 years ago, 12 years ago, I don't know. I think it was in your very early days. I bought a uh, black bait from you. Might not have been that long ago, actually. Nine years, I don't know. Quite a while ago. Do you, do you remember what that would have been? A black no. bait? You don't? No, not at all. I mean, I, I made um, a bottom bait, um, which was MB2. Um, I probably can't tell you the story behind what that stands for. Um pretty sure i can't to be honest okay um but that again that came from a bizarre flavor experience some dutch guys had asked me to copy something for them um which i did and someone else said look don't send them the bait because um they won't pay you for it um and it sat in my garage i had 10 15 liters of this stuff they're like this sample sat in my garage for years and in the end i wanted a new bait and um it was there so i thought i might as well use it and it was quite a deep one it like they called it sweet apple spice i mean it had like a, a hardcore concentrated apple in it but it was also a bit meaty aspects and garlic and all sorts of things um and that was that was also a very very good um flavor that did make a difference um i mean a lot of lot of the better ones i find i do find are oil based which is you know, this this opens up an argument. Can yeah, car, I'd like to oils. talk about that for sure. Yeah, um, <clears throat> it's a, it's quite a big thing in my thinking at the moment. You know, I mean, if you go um, so if you go back to the history of baits, I mean, so Fred's early baits now were fifty years ago, right? Um, and the idea being high nutritive value baits. Well, nutrition is the effect of food on the body, right? No, no, no more than that. So nutrition is protein. It's a full diet. It's vitamins. It's minerals. It's fats. It's everything. But for the last fifty years, the industry has been obsessed with protein um, and and aminos. Now, on any like, in, let let's strip it right back. Okay, so any any wild creature, I and mean, we're talking about a wild creature, the first thing it has to do when it wakes up is feed itself and its family for the day. Now, it, it won't necessarily eat the thing that's best for it. It'll find the thing that there's most of and fill it, will fill it up the quickest, right? Um, 
once that's been achieved, then the rest of the day is your own. I mean, as human beings, we've, we've become particularly lazy. We just go to Tesco's and we know what aisle our food's in and we pretty much choose it for flavour, again, rather than nutrition. So people have concentrated over and over and over and over putting protein into the lake. Now, there's, there's not going to be any carp in popular lakes that require protein, you know, because they can get it anywhere. And to be honest, all, all fishing comes down to comes down to that how ready how ready plentiful the food is the food item is you know if the fish are hungry and they're competing you'll catch a lot of them and you'll catch them quickly the more choice they have and the less they need it um, the harder they're going to be to catch and that also includes natural conditions as well like low dissolved oxygen or high water temperature which will make the fish naturally lethargic um but what people have failed to recognise from Fred's you know, original baits were the emphasis that he put on things like vitamins and minerals. You know? And if we feed an artificial bait that's protein heavy, the fish can become even more deficient in certain minerals and vitamins. And they can be real edges. Um, and I don't know if you want to cover it separately or just tag it on, but the use of carbohydrate now. Semolina, you know, everyone uses a bit of semo because it makes a bait firm, makes a bait roll nice. Um, and it's a good carbohydrate. Well, are there any good carbohydrates? You know, I don't, I'm not sure it's, a, it's something the fish needs. I think they can take all the energy, I think they can take all the energy quickly and directly from fat sources. And they're much, much better mm. to use the right fats in a bait than they carbohydrate. Yeah, but they they have a lot of uh, carbase enzyme within their body, so you you you'd think they have that for a reason. Uh, yeah, they have four times the amount of they do than they do proteases, uh, which which says to me it's pretty important for them. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, so it is you know a, com a different or living organism from us. They don't have stomachs, yeah. um, and I think when we talked on the phone before, um, I told you about fish where at times where they would just go and dive into deep still and gulp it in and suck it through, through them internally as well as out of the gills to take the acidic material to condition to condition their gut lining you know to digest food and to clear themselves out um i mean most people have been in a situation where they've seen fish bubbling over really heavy deep silt you know and they put a bait in there sat there all day bubbling away thinking anytime now you're going to catch but don't um, and then think, oh, my lead must be buried in the silt. Well, you know, the fish are buried in the silt. In the silt but, yeah. you know, they've probably ignored the bait, one, because it wasn't as acidic as the matter they were digging around for, or two, it was obviously like an alien object, you know, possibly even a stone. Um, so, I mean, there's... It, it, again, it comes down to fishing and situations. The way The way you apply a bait will always be just as important as the bait itself you know um i mean apart from the very easiest carp waters in the land a, a round ball will spell some sort of danger to fish at most points yeah definitely yeah yeah when you sort of linked in there from flavors onto onto the oils um is that sort of like were you, were you leading on with sort of like flavors on an oil base um, um yeah i mean a lot of really really good um flavors are oil based um ultra spice probably my favorite ever um the tutti frutti most people use now again oil based um a lot a lot of the cream ones i mean people still think now that tutti frutti is on ethanol right ethyl alcohol um i i don't think you'd get anyone to make any sort of flavour on ethanol right now. Um, I mean, some people do put a bit of vodka in and stuff, you know, for the winter. Yeah. But um, again, I, I've done incredibly well um, in winter fishing fats and lipids. Um, and th this is a little edge if anyone if anyone's interested. Um, so you can make your own oil powder quite simply. <clears throat> uh, if you take MCT oil or coconut oil, which is available anywhere, 60% of that, mix it with 40% maltodextrin, um, which is just cornstarch or carbohydrate starch, 
mm-hmm. um, mix it together and you get a, like a fatty powder. Now, what I put my hook baits in winter, I make coatings of that around my bait um, or leave them soaking in it. I mean, I, I've had three winter 60s um, on my last three winter trips, which is for the lakes I've been fishing, it's pretty good going as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, you know, a lot of powder flavors, they're actually based on maltodextrin. So if you want a really, really strong version of that, you can just mix a, a powder flavor 40, 60 straight into the oil and make your own powder coating out of that. I, yeah, <clears throat> I missed part of what you said there, but in the, the bodybuilding community, you might have just said this, so apologies if you have, but in the bodybuilding community, um, obviously ketogenic diet is massive. So you've got people using MCTs as well as um, C8 oil, um, which is the caprylic acid. Um, they mix, some, some of these companies mix the MCT with maltodextrin. Um, Do they? It's, yeah, I, you can literally... Mm. I'll go and get it in a minute. I've got a pack and it's 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 maltodextrin powder mixed with uh, MCT powder, uh, mm. which, which actually, for, for the reasons that they're selling it, it you, they're kind of working against each other a little bit. Um, but obviously, I mean, a bit there you go. I didn't even know that. So you, yeah. can either, you can either go and buy that off the shelf, put it on your spod mix or your um, PVA bag, or you can go on eBay and just buy some maltodextrin coconut oil for peanuts and make it yourself. And yeah. Yeah, and yeah. put your own little bits in it, you know. I'm sure it's multidextrin. I'll go and check in a minute. Yeah, um, it, can, it can be. It can be made from any, any from starch of anything, like you know, yeah. corn or barley or anything, just sort of boiled down. Really, it's it's it also tastes of next to nothing. It's very very neutral and bland, so it will take on flavors of everything else very nicely. Yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely. Uh, funny you mentioned Rich Worth Tutti Fruity. I've got a bottle of uh, the Rich Worth stuff on my desk. And uh, yeah, you have. Right. Yeah, I have. Yeah, I love this stuff. That and is, S- is it. Is it oh. the original? Original? It's the original. Original. Yeah. Okay. So this this is interesting. So if if you've got a little glass of water there and yeah. you drop it in there, is it an alcohol or is it oil based? Well, I've got. Oh, I've got beer or gin, which I don't really fancy. <laughs> <laughs> well, spice it up, mate. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, obviously, if it's an oil, it's gonna like drop. Yeah. 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 Up, yeah. Yeah. Will you two talk? I'll go and see what that MCT powder is and I'll get a bit of water. How about that? Yeah, no, that's cool. I mean, the rich worths, I mean, I think I've covered this in one of my books or my, my, my articles, you know, um, pe- people misinterpret it and they say, you know, it was a soya flour semolina bait um, and yet it outfished everything else. Well, again, it outfished everything else because when they were first available in the tackle shops, it became the most plentiful food supply, right? You know, yeah, yeah. Pe- you know, people for the first time ever could have a catapult and they could put 200 freebies in, you know, and straight away that's going to be a lot more appealing than fishing a bit of whiskers paste directly on the hook, you know? Um, yeah, for sure. It's like the, it's like, I guess, like in the modern era, like mainline cell, isn't it? It's The fish are all on the busy circuit waters, they're all pretty conditioned to it, which is going to help the, the catch results as well. Yeah, they, they are. Um, I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. Like you, you said before, um, I've, I've got friends who just buy bait off me. And do you know what? They don't even ask questions. You know, if, if they have it off me, they know it's going to catch. You know, they don't even know what it is. Um, mm-hmm. And they'll, they'll fish it and they'll not be bothered because they want to spend their time, you know, with their family or fishing or thinking about fishing and not thinking about bait. Um, and I, I, I get that, you know, I'm not really I, I mean i think we talked about it before i'm not really into the rig thing you know obviously it interests me because it's part of it but i don't play around for hours with little bits of components and things my, my rigs are just really simple that can be tied up in a minute you know um and if they're on a good bait in front of a feeding fish then I, i'm i'm happy with what i catch for sure um if in fact if i a couple of times i put pictures of my rigs up and people go like i God, there's bits of line everywhere, you know what I mean? Hanging off, being knots not finished, not trimmed down. Like, I'm, I'm famous for it for my tackle as well. You know, if it, it's none, none of it's lined up, handles aren't matched up, they're not even guaranteed to be the same rods and reels. You know, it's it's just it's there doing it. <laughs> it's, it's so true, though, mate. It's a, it's a massive fad, isn't it? Um, do you know something I was gonna I was gonna question you about, Jason, was um preservatives. So, like for me, with like 
making bait at home. Preservatives are not really something I've ever paid much attention to um because i never use them because it's always sort of like freezer bait or whatever uh, but i know with your company all of your baits are shelf life um and i know that sort of like shelf life baits of old had a for well they they were they were bad baits weren't they, they used to get rock hard bullets and yeah they were yeah they they, yeah. they were terrible and i think shelf life's are still sort of um got that stigma a little bit but i just wanted to sort of quiz you a little bit on preservatives and i thought that might be quite interesting for our listeners as well um and your yeah. take on them basically um well, um yeah i mean going back to the richworths again so obviously you know those freezers they had in the tackle shop they cost money to run um, they took up a lot of space. So then when Richworth first brought out their, um, their shelf life baits, I mean, they, they were like, sh- like I say, shiny and hard and um, just nasty. You know, I, I don't think they were a success because um, I don't I don't think they were any good. Um, it just seemed like a, there was a direct comparison. One was obviously to everyone streets ahead above the other. Now, I mean, Again, if you go walk into the shop, you've got what two or three aisles of, of freezer food. You know, you've got maybe three to five aisles of um, fresh food. And then you've got 20, 24, 24 aisles, something like that, of all goods that contain preservatives. So the, our, our own diet, we're feeding ourselves preservatives all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, and obviously in the food industry as well, that's something they're trying to regulate and cut down on and put in as little as little preservative as possible. And the, and the baits are the same way. I mean, I used to do this thing at the show where I'd put down six baits on the table. Um, three of them would be fresh. Three of them would be shelf life. And I would give a free kilo to a bait to anyone who could predict which were which. Um, and, and we used to give away virtually no bait at all. It was yeah. a no brainer. No, no one could guess it. Um, and that, that's where we got with it. I mean, we use hardly, hardly any. Um, it, it, it's sort of in a bait in limbo. You know, if I put a, on my website, I put a page about how to store it. You know, if you get any moisture in it, whether that be condensation in the summer or damp in the winter, you know, that extra moisture is going to turn it off. And that, that's how delicately balanced it is. Um, I, I started using them about 10 years ago and I've, I've only used sort of I've stabilized. I prefer really rather than preserved mm-hmm. and shelf shelf life, you know, is an outdated term. How, how old are the shelves in your house? You know what I mean? Like you know, about 30 years old. I mean, I mean, so we've, we've closed the factory this week. Um, and that's partly because a lot of the suppliers um, are shut down and there's no point in making up powder base mixes and having them sitting around, in a hydroscopic atmosphere you know there's even though they're shelf life baits they're still going to be freshly rolled and they're probably going to be a lot lot fresher than people who use them ones that have been in a tackle shop fridge um you had sean on didn't you a couple of weeks ago yeah 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 so sean's i won't go over all this again because sean's done a very good article on i think on his website and it's like how many how many days out the freezer or how old are fresh baits um and to put my own spin on that i mean when we worked at nash we brought out the bait called the key yeah which you will have heard of mm-hmm. um and people were saying how can you justify that it was sort of 16 pound um a kilo well it was actually a, a very good bait with very good ingredients but making it was the biggest ball ache as well and it was like under my tenure there so we had to reset the boiler times because the bait only had about 45 seconds in the boiler and it was uncooked in the centre. So within two hours of drying, um, it was straight in the freezer on drying racks. Obviously, you can imagine that takes up an enormous amount of space. So that then once it was it was sort of blast freeze, frozen, if you like. So then it was taken over to the packing plant and it had to be packed again within an hour and then bagged and boxed. And we could only stack them free high because of the softness. But then, of course, when the bait thawed out, logistically if the couriers had it in the warehouse overnight or something, it would collapse and people would get bags of paste. So it was, it was a concept of a bait and a very, very good bait in the right conditions. But logistically, it was just a nightmare to supply the thing. Um, so 
I, I started using the shelf lives basically because you can react so much faster with them. Um, you know, if I've got fish having it in the swim going crazy, I don't want to go, walk, go around the freezer, get 10 kilo out and then sit there for ages waiting for it to defrost. You know what I mean? I can literally just go to the car, grab a bag and I'm straight back in the game again. Um, if it's wet and horrible, I've not got hang bags around in the trees. Um, I've, I've got enough confidence in it to feed the fish in my lake with it. Um, and I don't think there's any, been any detriment to them at all. You know, I've, I've got fish that are 60 years old in the lake. Um, in fact, I've, I've, one of my taglines is that it, the world's oldest carp, you know, I've got a fish called Jurassic and I've got a photo of it um, when I, from 1970, you know, so God knows how old it was then. Yeah. Yeah. No. Awesome. <clears throat> um, and so, I mean, like potassium sorbates, sort of like everyone sort of bans that about, is it, this there's is be- this, yeah there's better things than that um, yeah that's just what I, I was gonna ask and probe you but i i am i understand you're not going to want to sort of give your secrets away um i mean i've i've used your bait the last sort of couple of years like on and off i've always got like a, a bag of wasp like in the boot of the car which is sort of like my backup bait that i leave in the, in the back of the car um and it's sort of like yeah, it's incredibly soft it keeps well you say about the moisture i've had that in the past but i think with it and once it gets like the moisture in, it has turned and gone off. Um, but I wanted to sort of like probe you on your on, on what you use. Um, so there's some things you say better than others. Uh, you don't have to say what you use, but yeah, you um, examples. I mean, I I I I share a few of my baits and secrets with with Jeff. Um, so I I can't necessarily sort okay. of steer in 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 line with some of the things that he uses. I mean, the wasp. Mm-hmm. Um, it's got some quite mad things in as well. I did a bit of uh, consultation work with DEFRA um, mm-hmm. on high, hybridised genetically modified crops. Now, again, people hear that and they think, oh, my God, GM crops. Now, this particular aspect of it, they're trying to design something that doesn't need pesticides and fertilisers. You know, in other words, it will grow in poor soil and grow quite quickly. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's hybridizing barley with hemp, which is quite effective, but it, it tastes disgusting, frankly. Um, but also, it's looking at this um, food to, to put on it, natural food, to encourage bees and pollination. Um, so that, that goes in the wasp, and that's actually where it got its name, because when I first got that additive, I was pretty much putting it in ground bait um, and just dipping baits in it and casting it out. And just about everyone who I sent this dip got stung absolutely crazy by bees and wasps. Okay. Um, yeah. And uh, <laughs> it, it, once, once you opened the glug pot, I mean, like in the summer, you, it was about five minutes before you could even go near it, you know. And by the end of the day, it would just be full of drowned wasps in it. Um, I mean, it was, it's not so bad in the bait, but even now people still say, shit, I, I keep getting stung, mate, when I'm using it. Um, so, again, that's taking something from nature, um, from one part of nature and, you know, moving it over to to another type of creature, you know, really, if you like, from insects to fish. But, um, yeah. <laughs> what Wasps are interesting, aren't they? I've, I've rolled a few baits, uh, not containing the ingredient that you're on about, but wasps have, have loved a few of them. It's a weird thing, isn't it? You wouldn't really associate a wasp with with that kind of apparatus to to detect it but they there's i've definitely rolled several baits where wasps are are all over it literally all over it i think um i think cats are quite a good judge as yeah. well you know cats, not definitely. not so much not so much dogs because they'll they'll like they'll strafe anything they can get hold of that's but, that's what yeah. i said yeah dean said dogs were a good one as well but i that's what i said dogs will eat fucking anything won't they I think, I've, yeah, I think more or less, um, cats seem a bit more discerning. Mm. Um, I mean, I know one one year, because um, I used to have like a big double garage and people would always come around the garage for bait and we'd be out there all night talking and stuff and used to really piss my wife off. Um, and I put I had these pallets in the corner. So one year, I think they'd cancelled the Brentwood show or something. And I had a lot of this nut bait. So I'd all double boxed it and I'd put it up on this pallet. Um, and I had all the fish meals in the bins and stuff. 
Anyway, one, one day I went to get um, a box of the nut bait and there was nothing there. And literally the rats had climbed up, or yeah, mice really, not rats, um, had climbed up underneath the pallet and bitten through all of it. And they'd gone through about 200 kilo of this nut bait, you know. And yet the fish meal was lying out there. They, they just wanted that nut bait. Um, I mean, that was a nightmare story in itself because my wife wouldn't let me kill them. So I had to humanely trap them in Essex. Um, and then she read, <laughs> then she read that they could come back um, two miles. So I had to drive them all over the Dartford Bridge and release them in Ken. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there was, there was, I got them all apart from one, and he was, he sort of become a little friend. He used to just sort of sit there um, and watch me, and he was all right, you know, this little mouse. But then one day I picked up a sack and I put it down on top of him, and he was sort of spread eagled on the ground. But you know, he, he lasted about two years, bless him. <laughs> He did all right. Give him the occasional nut boily to keep him going. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just to 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 change gears a little bit. I mean, obviously you were you were carp angling in a in a day and age in an area where it was. I mean, things were booming back back. You know, many years ago around your Essex. Are you Essex? You're Essex. Yeah, pretty yeah. much Essex, Hertfordshire yeah. border on, on Kent now. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, what did you? Did you fish locally when when you were sort of coming up? Well, I've actually I've actually written another book, um, which is my own book, if you like. So there's ten chapters of my original carp stories from the eighties. Um, then there's ten sort of bait formulation chapters, ten of fishing overseas, and then ten of the last year and everything. Whether I ever publish or not, a few people have seen like a rough draft on an e-file and stuff, and it, it's getting bigger and bigger. Um, but yeah, my early fishing, um, I mean, Waveney Valley was, you know, a major mm. influence. I used to absolutely love it up there. Um, Park Lakes of Essex, uh, Stanborough. We used to go fish poaching there for a night. I mean, uh, that was quite a mad one. I mean, that was the first time ever I had rolled lots and lots of bait. And we used to spend two nights a week rolling the bait and then we'd fish two nights a week and we'd go down the pub, have a pint, start bait up, going over a pint, walk around the lake, check if anyone was about. And about 12 o'clock, we'd be fishing. But after a month or so, he's using the halogen lights from the motorway as markers yeah. um, and sticking it out. And after about a month, the fish got so on that bait, they were swirling and taking it off the top as it was landing, you know, mm. absolutely crazy. I mean, we just caught hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of fish. You know, it's just nonstop for about four or five hours, pack up and go to work. Um, St. Ives was probably the last place I fished in the UK. Um, and quite madly, the, the, the fish I had, it was my first 30 pounder. It was about 1990. Um, that fish is still alive in there. And I think it's close to 50 pound. And I was contemplating going back this year. And, and fishing it again um i think it might happen this year possibly what that that was what year was that uh that would have been about 1990 oh, um that was long before so, the uh, yeah i mean lady. yeah pe people don't sort of get it i mean i think my first double figure my first 20 pound cart was 1984 yeah um and i had caught about 150 double figure fish from that um i used to go to holy fields a lot wolfram abbey and you know, I, I catch a hundred fish in a day there, you know, literally. Sure. Um, which, again, you know, in front, I I've caught over a ton of fish in France t on ten occasions. Um, I mean, these these catches now they bear no resemblance to going back to those days. So I mean, I had like 150 doubles for my first 20 pounder. Um, I don't know how many 20s for my first day. The the big fish weren't about. You know, there was probably four or five forties in the whole country, you know, and, and you couldn't, you couldn't get to them. Um, but again, didn't need to, do you know what I mean? I was enjoying my fishing, doing my own thing. Mm. Um, and certainly the, the book I've done, it's of those days, it's just about more about the mishaps of things, you know, that went wrong and yeah. Um, yeah. Like. And, and the, and the adventures, the adventures, you know, yeah being shot at fucking pram prams going in the water all sorts of stuff like that <laughs> you, so do you do you reckon you're going to go ahead and publish it 
Um, I've sent a few people out the e-file. It, um, I sort of wondered really whether it's just through vanity. Um, I mean, and then I think, you know, I, I'm already, I, I'm stuck. I think when you get to a certain age, like the male brain, um, to, 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 to learn something new, you have to forget something old. <laughs> you know, I, I you don't yeah. forget the wife shopping on purpose. It was because she was remembering who won the 1984 derby or what the football score was last week or something like that, you know. And I've, some, some of what I've learned about bait, I've pretty much forgotten and you might relearn it or... Yeah, you, yeah. But that's the, and that's the other trouble we're writing about bait is it, became, it becomes outdated, you know, as your theories adapt and you learn more. Um, I mean, I did a thing with this guy I know in Canada um, where he caught a few 20s and we put them in a tank. And we put a thermostat on the tank um, over six months to replicate winter, lowering and raising the thing and feeding them different feedstuffs. And that, that was, again, quite interesting. So I do cover that um, in the new book as well a bit, you know, and that was quite eye-opening, again, in favour of the oils and the fats, you know, and people naturally think that as you go into winter um that you know that's the first thing you lose but it's not necessarily the case at all yeah i know what you mean about it becoming outdated but i think it, it then just sort of bookmarks the thought process of the time i mean like you know if you read like rod's old books it's stuff we all know and sort of take for granted now but it's still nice to read it and sort of get a perspective on it that you, you can tell it was kind of fresh thinking when it was written. If, if am I making sense? So absolutely. Plus yeah. also Rod was an exceptional storyteller. He, um, yeah. So, he'd make a shot yeah. a trip to Tesco sound fucking amazing. Wouldn't he? <laughs> yeah, he, he would. And he could have caught five pound fish, yeah. you know, and <laughs> it, it, it wouldn't have mattered. No. I mean, Ter Terry's coming close now. Yeah. You know, yeah. When, he, when he does these little chats by the fireplace, you know, yeah, the passion you get from him is just engaging, isn't it? It yeah. just makes you want to go fishing, um, or go and buy a bag of casters. <laughs> but <laughs> uh, but no, Rod Rod was a truly gifted storyteller. But he he was also he was like that in real life, you know. Um, he told me a story about their first year um, on the syndicate at Save, and they had this pool that everyone paid into, and the one that caught the most fish was going to take the pool. Um, and he was lead angler, um, tied, two days to go. And with, with Kerry, I believe the story went. And so they decided to share the money. And Rod worked out that it would just about give him back all the money that he paid for the boilies. Um, and he said to Kerry, he said, so what were you using? And he said, oh, I two, two bags of bird's eye beef burgers and some semolina. Right? Um, and it transpired that's exactly what he was using. Um, but the following yeah, mental, the following season, he caught absolutely nothing. Um, and the, the variation, the difference that made the difference was the fact that the beef burgers didn't have onion in. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Which again, you know, I mean, if you can find it in the shop, which I can't onion puree buy all of it. Yeah. Mm. That's all I'll say on that one. What, well, I know you've just said that's all you say, so I guess I'm disrespecting um, that. But what, what is it in the onion that you feel is so... I mean, Mexican onion oil is a classic, which is... Which yeah, but you, but just get an onion and just grate some in your ground bait or your stick mix. Fish love it. I mean, it's it's pungent. It's just one of those where, you know, people say, oh, you know, the fish love garlic. And they do all variations of garlic oil. But just if you can bear to do it and you, you've got an understanding partner, then... You know, just grate some onions up. I mean, if I if I could grate up onions on a biblical scale, you know, to make five kilo bait, then I'd probably do that. Um, it, it's, it's, it's another great additive. I mean, think things like, um, right, so another one, you know, Danny with all these Munga mix ground baits and stuff, it used to really, really piss me off that he would add the hemp after he had boiled the bait. You know what I'm saying? Once it's been boiled, nothing's going to be drawn into it what's the point but you know I've, I've since noticed that you know chili flakes the fish will dig around for them for days once the bait's gone yeah. you know in the bottom silt looking for things coffee grinds is another one exactly the same um oh, pete yeah. do you remember me getting all the coffee grinds i do mate yeah from <laughs> starbucks or somewhere wouldn't it 
No, <laughs> Starbucks, mate. Back in Starbucks wasn't in Cornwall back then. Is it even in Cornwall now? Yeah, I remember unless it was. <laughs> It was from my work. I um, worked at a holiday park and, and they we had like this coffee bar and uh, I used to get the coffee grinds from there. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Ginger's another one that, that people don't really use in this day and age. Do you write, do you write ginger? Um, do you know what? I've, I've not used it extensively enough to, to be emphatic on it, but I know a lot of people that do, you know, a lot of people that I would trust, um, but I haven't used it extensively. Do, do you rate it? It's, it's never been a, a fantastic one for me, to be honest. Um, but then I reject things very quickly. Um, I mean, clove oil was always a fantastic one, especially mixed yeah. with, with the Ultra Spice, which is probably a classic. Yeah. Um, well, did, uh, didn't, didn't Ultra Spice contain clove oil? Yeah, and, and quite a lot of different eugenols as well. Yeah, uh, yeah. But again, you know, with the essential oils, I, I used to find they could be quite volatile. I mean, one of the famous ones that went around everyone for ages was the Alba soil, right? Did you, you yeah. know? Yeah. Um, yeah. Pete and it, it, it would work, but it had to be at such a low level, you know, literally a drop per kilo. Um, and there was people like glugging half a bottle in and it smelt sort of like a Vicks yeah. vapor rub at a rave, you know, and uh, just rep repugnant. Yeah. So get, again, you know, if if you're not really sure, um, and I guess this is where field testing comes into it to an extent. Um, but mm, I don't know if I should say that. I mean, sort of. Uh, all, all Nash will have tons and tons and tons of field testers, but how many of them will actually give useful output? Most of them want cheaper bait, right? Exactly. Um, yeah. Yeah, and also we we've, we've made a rod for our own back in the industry and with things like carp talk with the prizes where people would catch a fish, let's say it was on a bit of corn and claim it was on their bait to win a prize and stuff like that, you know, and which I've always thought on whatever level you look at it is dishonesty. You know mm. what I mean? There's, there's people looking at that and, and, and they think they're going out and buying the bait on that strength, you know? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. De I do agree with you. Um, but going back to your essential oil that, clove was one i used to really rate in the winter and and cinnamon uh cinnamon oil cinnamon leaf specifically uh really rate in the winter both of them obviously really high in eugenol is, is that is that an area that you've looked into essential oils in general or or even eugenol in winter Anything um expand on that? yeah yeah yes but sort of both i mean so i think there's still things you can do with essential oils that um it, it's something I've sort of passed on, you know. I mean, I don't think it's any magic key that's going to unlock it. It can sort of round off a bait um, to my final part of a jigsaw. I mean, when I was telling you about that bait at Stambra um, that we used to use, the only thing that was in that bait was um, five or six drops of iso you mm know. -hmm. Um, and if you've never smelt that, it smells like dentist it, filling. That's you know? the best place to get it, the dentist. Yeah. They um, have the proper pure stuff, yeah. Exactly that. So, you know, it's not, you know, something that would be massively appealing, but it was a fantastic label on that bait, yeah. you know, and it's something that they could identify. Um, I mean, do I, do I think fish can identify baits in lakes? Again, it goes back to how many fish are in the lake, how many people are fishing it. Um, I think if you take, let's say, average sort of 10 acre pit and there's a dozen people fishing it every day, everyone's firing in a couple of kilos of boilies now c can the fish tell one kilo of boilies from another i wouldn't by the time they swam all around around the lake i'd say probably no you know um it's it's like the whole amino thing it, it's that's an absolute minefield you know and you will drive yourself absolutely crazy with aminos you you can have really really good results on them you can also make things uh Helen. yeah yeah i mean the nash cultures fantastic fantastic hook baits um but they did used to have a, hot, a high vitamin content in as well and i think that was partly it um but we we made up a load and i think we did it in the winter and like um the fish proteins were too solid and it didn't distribute around the bait and they all came out weird shapes so i took away about 30 kilos of cultures um and put them all in the swim 
and it killed that swim stone dead for about three weeks. Yeah, just too much. Guy yeah. said there weren't a fish anywhere near it, you know. Yeah. Um, same thing when, when I discovered the acids or, you know, started going along. I had come up with this sort of theory of blending organic acids together and making up this powder. Um, we was on a session down the south of France and we're four days into it, and we hadn't had, we hadn't had a single bite. Um, and out of desperation, I had some eggs and I knocked up some paste, which I wrapped around the lead and around the hook bait with these acids in. And I put the rest in the ground bait, about 20 kilos of ground bait. And over the next two days, um, I think I caught 32 fish from like a standing star. And honestly, at the time, I thought I'd found the Holy Grail, you know. Um, but it, it can depend on the time of year. You know, obviously, the magnet theory, if you're fishing in the winter over silt with an acidic bait, it's not as effective. The summer seems to be the time you can have a magic result. I mean, one, one guy at work, um, he's doing this fishing for these F2, F3s, whatever they do with the feeders and stuff. And I, I gave him some and he said, how much should I use? And I said, well, I use 20 grams per kilo in the boilies. So he put 20 grams in. And uh, at work, he said, mate, it's didn't do very well, really. The guy either side of me won the match, so I felt like I was near the fish. Um, but I finished well down the field. Anyway, the next week, same thing. Next week, same thing. And for so, how often are you recasting? He said, "No, you, you know, there's a lot of fish. You know, there's sort of three or four pound. You have to get a big weight weight of them." Um, he said, "I'm casting every five or ten minutes." And I thought, right, okay. So I'm encapsulating this additive in a boiled bait. And he's just putting it in, in a method feeder on ground bait. I said, mate, go down to two grams and see how you go. Anyway, cut a long story short, he won the next uh, next 10 matches. Um, I think he won about two or three grand. I'm still waiting for a drink off him now, actually. <laughs> <laughs> he's slacking. <clears throat> I mean, uh, on the topic of flavours uh, and, and baiting up, and I know what you mean about a carp swimming around a busy like day ticket water. You know, it's swum past God knows how many different freaking compounds. It's it's chemo reception fatigue, isn't it? Yeah. Um, well, I've I've got my own carp here where I live in my pond, and uh, I test on them, but I make sure I don't just test loads of shit one after the other. I give them you know a long time in between. I'll test maybe two or three things a day, so they don't get that that chemo reception fatigue. Yeah. So to, to, to build on that in terms of adding specific flavors, you know, either liquid or powdered flavors, concentrated flavors to a bait, do you feel like it's simply, and this is what some people would believe, I don't believe it, but some people believe it, it literally just adds a label to the bait. So when obviously that person's baiting up, they're not baiting up for everyone else. It's, it's establishing that one bait and the carp can differentiate that and then they hone into that. Or yeah, do you feel um, the flavors in their own right contain compounds, um, you know, lactones or esters or whatever that is actually attractive in its own right? I, I know, I know, I know where you're going. Um, so, firstly, I'd say you know, like the the amino thing, um, or whatever. I, I, my analogy is that you walk into a room and there's 30 different radios playing. Um, yeah. One of them's playing a, your favorite tune, you know. So how can you find it that and i think that's that's the sort of amino disturbance that's underwater sometimes because everything contains aminos like the water the plants you know um yeah I, i'm i'm on about flavors sorry to, so to from, no no no, no that's I'm on cool. about flavors yeah yeah so from flavors so you mentioned the cell in the terms of the cell i think they pick the coconut flavor as as a blind because it was probably the most unlikely flavor that anyone would ever use. Um, and of course, everyone started thinking there was coconut products in it and that sort of thing. Um, and that was a label in such. Now, if I'm making a bait, I, I start with one product, which I think is unique or will make a massive difference. Um, and then I manufacture the bait around it. Um, so in other words, just to complement it, not to overpower it, just to get the mo most out of that one ingredient. In terms of flavour, um, I think most of my baits, they're, they're not massively flavoured. We'll clear that at the start with, you know, sort of mm -hmm. three or four mil, I think it's plenty. Um, often I will look into it. I will look at the recipe. 
and I will see if there's something in there that's going to be complimentary or else it's looking to something, something naturally screams out of you as being compatible, you know? Um, so like, so keramine goes really well with liver powder, you know, yeah. and if you wanted to put a label on that, you'd probably put something on like a maple or a cream or something like that. And that's just, years of being in bait and thinking what sits right or looks mm. right or smells right, you know? Yeah. A lot of free aminos in uh, caramine as well, isn't there? Um, yeah. I, I didn't, yeah. I think I've probably confused you, mate. I'm, I, these gins have kicked in already. <laughs> um, I didn't mention the cell. Um, w- what I was asking is, do you think flavors serve just to label up your bait, just to give them a, a label or do you think they're actually attractive in their own right? So do you think like a good flavor is actually attractive to carp in its own right? Um, yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, so, so what I was trying to sort of convey to you is it's one of, it's one of the least important things of, yeah. in my bait. You know, um, I'm pretty sure that any of the baits, you could take the flavor away and it would probably be just as effective. Yeah, it's kind of just a way uh, of of branding it or giving it an identity. Um, having said that, you know, as I said before, some flavors are exceptionally good year in year out. You know, I mean, carp come and go, and then you'll get a new generation of carp, and they'll find the same thing just as attractive. Yeah, um, and that that will be because there's something in the makeup of that flavor that is a particularly appealing thing to that fish. So when you're, Definitely. sorry, when you when you're sort of formulating a bait, Jason. I know, like earlier, we touched on <clears throat> essential oils, and you were sort of you're sort of saying that your your sort of stance on that is it sort of it can sort of like round off like a bait, or it can be sort of like the final bit of the jigsaw. Uh, and we're talking about sort of flavors in themselves as well. Um, and you're saying sort of like you can take that away from any bait, and you know you think you think the bait's likely to be as, as effective in itself. For you, when you're sort of formulating a bait, what is it you sort of, what, what are your sort of your building blocks for attraction? Uh, my, my building block will be that, that one main thing that I've resourced or looked into, um, which is generally something. Um, so so if, we, if we go back to Hutchinson, I don't know if you remember, he, made, he came out with a load of um, powder mixes originally. Do you remember those? Catcher mixes or... Yeah, um, catch them. Yeah. So they, they wouldn't roll. They were an absolute fucking nightmare. You, know, you couldn't put them together. So there was, I think there was like seafood blend, white lightning, sucra blend, that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. So they were all, they were all concepts. They were all ideas in his head. You know, the, the sucra blend was like a really high sugar base mix, which um, some people are working on now. I know it's going to be um, baits coming out along those lines. I mean, so uh, another another little thing, and uh, I, I've, I've had a couple of brandies now, by the way, as well. It's <laughs> good, mate. Loosen up. So, Get those lips so, loose, yeah. Jason. So, <laughs> so what, one one of my friends works for UNICEF, um, and they had a load of stuff that was going out of date. It's called Plumpy Nut. Yeah, have you heard of that? <laughs> no, I've got a few Plumpy right. Nuts, but yeah. <laughs> So it's it's the emergency respond food they take to third world uh, countries to keep people um, alive, basically little sachets. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I had a load of this UNICEF stuff, which I um, decanted into a bucket um, and I sort of spray dried it into a powder. It, it's basically as high a calorie food as you can possibly make. Um, now again, fantastic, you know. So. To, do fish crave calories? Absolutely. You know, like I said, it's, it's easily available food. It's filling themselves up. Um, is it ethical that we feed fish on really high calorie, high fat baits? I, I don't think so. I try to moderate it and do it in proportions. You know, I'm not sure it's the way to go. Definitely. I mean, I've, I've got theories that the fish in France generally, you know, are mature fish before they get stocked and they've grown up. Um, they've developed properly whereas I think you know you stock fish sort of five to ten pound they get hounded they get caught they get suspicious of food they get damaged I think it holds them back I think it stops them growing you know fish that have partial natural diets are always going to last longer 
than something that's been fed on an artificial diet. I'm, I'm very skeptical of pellets. You know what I mean? If you do any tests with oils at all, you can see how quickly they oxidize and go rancid. Yeah. And, uh, you know, anyone who buys pellets from a tackle shop, um, yeah. no offense to the company that's selling them, but, you know, what I mean, they're probably well past their best by the time they've been sold. Um, then, then, then again, I mean, <sighs> trout pellets, screttins, fantastic, fantastic bait. Yeah, as long as you can get them, um, you know, it's Fresh. a high turn. Yeah, it's a high turnover, isn't it? You buy them yeah. from the source. You know, they've been recently made. It, it, exactly that. Um, you know, and they, they feed them on them for a reason. But again, yeah. you know, a fish that's in a natural pond eating mealworms or larvae and stuff, it, it might not get to the size of the fish that's been grown artificially, but it's probably going to have a longer lifespan. <laughs> How long do you think sort of like flavors flavors can last for? Because obviously, I mean, we mentioned this on a podcast a little. Well, I think probably the most recent one we published, and um, we got one sort of um, comment as a little bit of heat on social media for for sort of bringing it up. But we were saying it sort of like touched on the like the flavors of of, of years past that people are buying yeah. for silly money, and just saying that they're sort of like they're oxidized and well past their best. Um, How long can you keep a flavor for? It, it, depend, it depends exactly really what it's doing, doesn't it? You know, um, but then again, you, you've got to think, you know, there's a few of those ingredients that come out of the fridge. Um, just about all the bottles from all those ingredients, they might have long use-by dates, but they've still got use-by dates. And none of, them are none of them are 20 years, you know. If it still smells of what it smells of, then you, you can get, you know, you're still creating the sort of label you want to create. I mean, so I'll give you an example, like the sweet corn flavour. Um, so started making a thing called Plasti Soak at Nash that would soak in flavour artificial baits and stuff. I know that stuff. Um, yeah, it contains quite a lot of dimethyl sulphide, um, which naturally oxidises, but not necessarily in a bad way. So basically once it's been made, from the moment it's been made, really you should leave it. You should... All of these flavors, whenever you make them, you should leave, you should shake them up, leave them, and you should leave them to settle, really, in all honesty, um, before selling them. But once so once this goes on the shelf, it will just get darker and darker. So, I mean, Kevin rung me up. Um, someone had complained, one of you saying that, you know, they were getting these products and they were dark brown. Sometimes they were yellow. But it was the nature of the beast. You know, it wasn't less effective. It's that particular chemical does that particular thing it will discolor things over time. Um, so, I mean, we certainly when we were there, we used to have quality controlled samples like from manufacturer and after six months so we could compare them. Um, and, and they will change in appearance, definitely. You know, same as um, like you, you'll notice with the flavours, well, we, certainly in the bigger volumes, after a long time, you'll start getting sediment in the bottom as well, you know, and bar crystals and things like that. Would I would I buy a, a twenty year old flavor for two hundred quid? No, but I'm 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 thinking about other counterfeit market already. <laughs> <laughs> you know what that that brings us back to where I left you guys earlier on. Um, I went and got some water, and uh, yeah, I knew it was uh, oil based anyway, but um, dropped it in, did the test, and yeah, it's definitely oil based. I sent you a photo, Jason, but. Um, wicked mate yeah the, I, the photo doesn't pick it up that it's oil but it's all floating on the surface and it's all yeah you can tell it's oil um, and that was and that was the original one yeah yeah original richworth tutti yeah. fruity so so there's there's an there we go we've exploded an urban myth straight away yeah you know everyone always said tutti fruit was the ultimate winter flavor because um it was ethanol or ethyl alcohol based um and it would dissolve quicker in the water where all along it was an oil based flavor yeah yeah 100 percent yeah Hundred mm. mm -hmm. percent. Interesting. So it really gets like when you sniff it, for example, like the original two. It really gets like the back of the throat. And it, this bottle is old as fuck. It still makes me cough. <laughs> if I give it a good old yeah. whiff, it makes you cough. Yeah. Well, I mean, we we used to sell it um, when we when I used to make it with Bob. We used to sell it to three different um, companies, fishing companies, who all branded it a different name, but it, it was exactly the same. You know what I mean? If we made like a 20 litre jar of it, you know, yeah. one bloke would get 10 litres, the other two would get five. And we would just separate it and put a different sticker on it. 
and they so, they all sold it, and I believe still do, um, big companies as well, and under different banners, um, and people will argue till till their nose bleed that it's different, um, and sometimes you know you're better off you just sort of have a little grin and have a little laugh because you think well it wasn't last week while I was putting the stickers on you know. <laughs> See, this is this is something I want to talk to you about because, I mean, and it, it's not for me to say the companies. You can divulge them if you want to, but another company um, which sold the Tutti Frutti flavor as a blend, let's just say that. Yeah. See, theirs, I remember, and I've got a bottle of their current one, which is different, by the way, but theirs, I remember to be yellow. And I remember the Tutti Frutti stuff, it, it was orange. This one's orange as well. Yeah. Um... What What is that? about because i don't doubt what you're saying um and i think you know you're on the right you're, you're on the right company because it is called blend yeah yeah that's, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, i know exactly what you mean and you are right yeah. um but there's nothing stopping you putting dye in them right true yeah, well, yeah fair enough so you have oil soluble dyes um as in like the case of red liver oil um you know flavors of obviously the same flavors you can use for the boilies which are semi-soluble you can make solutions and you can dye the flavors instantly it looks different um but it's also a way of getting brand standard as well like i said to you with the discoloration yeah if you're worried about the discoloration on the shelf then by putting in one gram of, of orange flavor then you're dyeing it that color and the likelihood is it's going to stay roughly that that color you know that's a great point yeah i i mm. literally never thought of that yeah, really. Good. Um, I mean, you know, put it in the broad sense word, red diesel, right? It's yeah. it's just diesel yeah. with with red agent in it for the sole purpose of, and then it becomes, you know, farm diesel. Yeah. Um, but it's the same product. Yeah. I've got one for you, and I asked this, I think, to Dean, and I can't remember what his answer was. I think he he wasn't he wasn't too sure, but I've somebody sort of um, fairly good authority was telling me that the original Robin Red. Um, used to obviously dye out your buckets sort of bright red it used to sort of well used to see the fish with the red bellies and the red sort of like the, under the gill plates and everything um and that was apparently the dye that's in red diesel which they've had to remove i don't know if you know or can shed any light on that um yeah i uh, i mean really you're gonna have to ask haifs the question aren't you yeah, um, I've never guessed so, a proper answer. I mean, I, I, I found <laughs> earlier in the back uh, back of my kitchen earlier, I found a bucket of Piri Piri seasoning um, and it was it all in one block. So I threw it in the bin, but I sniffed it and it basically smelt like Robin Red used to smell. You know, um, I mean, there was there was actually a might have been Hutchinson. I did like a Robin Red flavor and it sort of smelt tobacco-y, but it, it, it definitely had like paprika in and there's, there's all the talks of the carafils and things. Um, yeah. Mate, it's, yeah, it, it's, highly, it's highly likely. Um, I mean, I think I, I do remember fish spots on and stuff, but that was, that was probably in the early days, wasn't it, when waters were dominant, you know, everyone was on it and everyone was piling it in. Mm -hmm. um, and now people make their own, don't they? They, they mix up. Um, paprika and chili and red dye and it to be honest it's just as effective really isn't it yeah some some of the ones people making are really convincing in texture and absolutely everything um of the hay stuff it's yeah yeah i mean so yeah i mean obviously you, you have different dyes that are oil soluble dyes um i'm trying to think of the one that goes in diesel i, I do know what it is but it, yeah. oh, red 40 Mm, no it's not no um, no I'd, I'd have to i'd have to look it up but um it, again it's it's nothing more than a die you know what i mean for that sole reason of as an identifier um i don't know i mean i suppose the experiment it would be to eat a, a couple of pounds of paprika um and then see like if you started changing color <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think your shit would be an interesting colour. <laughs> other, other than that, I don't know. I'm pretty much living off microwave curries at work anyway, so it's not going to make that much difference. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. Sorry, I completely uh, changed the track there when I went on to that. I can't even remember where we, where we were. Sorry, Sam. Wait, no, 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 no not, not at all. 
No, you're just saying about um, our flavors the same flavors because they're a different color. That you know, it. A, you know, it's <clears throat> it wouldn't be the biggest trick in the world. You know what I mean? Just to drop a bit of dye in there to make something look like something. Yeah, definitely. I mean that that old tutti, you know, in its original form. Is that is that still? Because I mean that's. I mean the. Well, I'm like all over the place here, I know, but the the old the the tutti, um, the Richworth tutti fruity boilies. I think it was more than just the flavour that that was at play there. And I know, you know, when it first came out, the competition, so to speak, wasn't so strong. But I think e even in the more recent years, when that was still available, it was still a an amazing winter bait. I did very well on it, um, as well as the Esterberry. But I think there was more to that boilie than than just yeah. you know, soya semo. Yeah, I yeah. suppose it had a lot of sugar in it, ice and sugar and other things. Yeah, but... well, no, you, you got to stop there, I think. Um, so there's there's a bit, I think it's in my new book rather than something I've done before. Right. Um, I think the difference in the effectiveness of that bait is when they stop putting real sugar in. Um, now, obviously, sugar's really hard to roll, so you use powdered sugar, icing yeah. sugar. Yeah. Um, so... High volumes of it, I, I believe, were p partial preservatives as well. Um, and they stopped using that, and then they put in a synthetic sweetener. Um, so people get really excited about all the brand names, Thormatins and Talin and Betalin and all of this. Um, mate, it's art artificial sweeteners, right? So if you did the Pepsi challenge with 100 people and you said, what do you prefer, real sugar or artificial sweetener? I bet 99% of those people would choose the real sugar, okay? But they're not going to eat it because it's going to make them fat. Now, one, the people that want to make the carp fat, and two, the carp don't care if they are fat. So why not use the real thing? Um, so, I mean, I, I've made, I've probably made enough artificial sweetener to fill this church I'm living in, right? Um, I've made tons and tons and tons and tons of it. Um, so it's a mix of saccharin products, um, some preservative, and some IPA to dissolve it, isopropyl alcohol, yeah. um, obviously at small level, which isn't a very palatable thing. Um, I mean, going back a little bit to what we said earlier about people, you know, they, they won't use a preserved bait, um, and yet they'll fish a preserved bait on, on the hair. You know, yeah. they'll, use, yeah. they'll use a waft or a pop-up that one contains that preservative. <laughs> So what, so what they've effectively done is highlight, if they believe it's less effective, you know, they've highlighted that their, their bait is less effective than the rest of what they've thrown out. I mean, I, it, it, it doesn't yeah. make sense, you know? I suppose um, people would, would say about that they're not digesting the hook bait, but they are digesting the... the um, they, they would, but if the argument is that it's less appealing because of the smell or the taste of it and the chemo reception um, rather than the, the gustation, is that going to detect it right that that's that's the argument so it, it does go down mm. um i mean people use artificial sweeteners because by volume it affects the bait far less and it's easier to roll right you can you can put half a mil or one mil dash of sweetener in whereas you know you might have to put in sort of 50 grams of icing sugar uh, and it's a lot muckier but um that is where i believe richworth lost the plot a bit that's that's what i think anyway i, I don't know i mean obviously that's that's my guess you, you yeah i mean you can just tell by leaving them out of the freezer for a few days you know when it, you, you can tell how they turn can't you? you you know the ones that had the icing sugar in or whatever type of sugar that they did use i think it's it's sort of taken as gospel that it was icing sugar but who who knows not me that's for sure i mean um, i bet you i bet you've had the conversation where you've opened a can of sweet corn um, and someone said to you, don't, don't lose the liquid or don't tip the liquid away, yeah. it's the best bit, right? Because yeah. um, it was full of sugar and it was full of salt. Um, and now it isn't because in our health conscious lives now, um, people have to declare what they put in and it looks bad, you know, if your can of sweet corn has 50% of your daily sugar allowance. Now, that was one of the things that used to make it attractive. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I, if I'm cooking up particles or ground bait, I mean, I always toss a bit of sugar in it or a bit of salt because it's basic seasoning, right? You know, if you have chips, you always put salt on it um, just because it tastes better. Simple as that. And I think 
Um, with with the sweeteners, I think all these artificial sweeteners, mate. Um, no, I just don't go near them. What, what about something like thormatin, which I mean, it's from a natural tree, but really it's kind of synthetics. It's manufactured. Yeah. yeah it, it's would you class a, that along with them? Yeah, it's just it's just yeah. a brand name. Again, people have used it and they'll have confidence in it. Um, but would they have caught more if that they'd been using real sugar? Um, well, I, I know the answer, but you know, everyone has to find out has to find out their own path, don't they? But, um, but yeah, but but then I suppose, and I'm not against what you're saying at all. I'm just playing devil's advocate. I suppose the sugar within a bait, you know, powdered sugar, obviously, is doing a different function than what say someone that just wanted to take the, just to add a bit of sweetness to you know, quote unquote take the edge off of a bait or a flavor profile, which is totally human terms, you know, not necessarily carp re- related. I think people maybe use them with a different idea of their outcome, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so with, with new, going back to nutritional recognize, uh, recognition, um, I mean, if you believe in the theory that, you know, they can detect proteins, then you also have to believe that they can detect calorific count um that they can check like for an energy source um for vitamins especially you know uh, so again again vitamins nobody puts vitamins well some people do most companies don't spend money on vitamins because th- there's no end product to the user that they can see and sniff they have to take your word for it that they're in there mm-hmm. um now a lot of my bait finds my way into my lake so you know i i want yeah, I want the fish to get the vitamins. I, I, I mean, I close it for six months in the summer um, to sort of reset the fish's compass, you know, to give them confidence in eating again. And I'll, I'll throw a bit of bait. Ideally, I'll throw a bit of bait in there for two or three weeks, get them eating, and then I'll load it up with s- certain vitamins to put them in because I know it will get into them that way and it will do them good, you know, at a time of year when when they can probably use a bit of help. Um, but I, I put a lot of faith in vitamins as attractors. Um, and you know, I, I like you say with the, the tank tests and the pond tests and things like that, it's not the be all and end all. But if you, if you see a really really positive strong response to something, um, it, 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 yeah. it's worth pursuing. Always, you know. Well, that concludes part one with Jason. I'm sure you'll agree that was absolutely fascinating. In part two. Jason goes into even more depth about flavors and ingredients and how to get the best from your carp bait. He starts off part two by telling us what he believes the absolute most attractive attractors are for carp. So you don't want to miss that. He also tells us about some of his exploits abroad. Um, He's traveled the world extensively done a lot of fishing in different countries and he's got some great stories to tell there so you do not want to miss part two make sure you check that out and make sure you let us know what you think by leaving us a review on the podcast app that you use to listen to this everyone that leaves us a review will be entered into a prize draw to win 100 pounds worth of goods so it really is worth you know 20 seconds of your time just to leave us a review that's it for this episode i look forward to seeing you in the next one